And welcome to Understanding Tomorrow's Nuclear Energy Lecture Series. My name is Sung Jin Kim, uh, Captain James F. McCarthy, Jr., and Sherry McCarthy, Head of Nuclear Engineering at Purdue University. Uh, this lecture is presented to you as part of jo the joint effort by Purdue University and Duke Energy to explore feasibility of using advanced nuclear technology to meet our campus community's uh, long-term energy needs. Uh, today's special, because uh, before we begin today's event, I'd like to recognize and give a special welcome to Congressman Greg Pence in the audience, who is one of our Hoosier Hoosier representatives on the Energy and Commerce Com Committee in the U.S. House of Represent Representatives. Please join me in welcoming Congressman Pence to the stage for a few remarks. Thank you. Thank you all for having me today. I'm, uh, this is my first time I've been up to Purdue. I live about 30 minutes from Indiana University, and I won't say any more, okay? We, we won't get into that. I am on the Energy and Commerce Committee, have been for a number of years. I'm on the Energy Subcommittee, where nuclear is a real focus of ours. One of the highlights of every week when I'm in Washington, D.C., is that we have a breakfast at the end of the week, and, and, and nuclear comes up every time. You know, uh, I am a Republican. Uh, my conference on the Energy and Conference Committee, uh, uh, and Commerce Committee, is uh, very much an all of the above focused group, okay? We, we don't, we're, we're not trying to protect any industry or have negative feelings about any other. In particular, nuclear is something that we're committed to. And last year, or last Congress, 117th Congress, we introduced eight bills. We will be reintroducing those. I'm not sure how they fit with you all. When it comes to funding, we are wide open. Uh, we're, we're very supportive of putting the money necessary to move nuclear forward in this country. Uh, and we hope that uh, the policy uh, that uh, Secretary Huff can do can help us with uh, moves it forward in this country. I'll share you. I'll, I'll finish with the with the four goals that we have stated on uh, the Republicans on our committee, and they are easing the permitting process. We want to help with that. Enhance nuclear regulatory commission licensing structure, personnel issue, I believe. Help establish a reliable supply of nuclear fuel. Uh, take a look at where it's coming from and, and help with that. And then reform nuclear waste storage programs. And when I say uh, we want to do this in a very collaborative way, and just to let you know, uh, Energy and Commerce is here. I'm here as a representative for the state of Indiana, here for nuclear and here for Purdue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Congressman Pence, for joining us today. I also want to take this opportunity to thank you for your excellent service uh, for this important committee uh, for the nation and for the state. Uh, today's speaker uh, will be introduced by Mr. Chris Nolan. Uh, Mr. Nolan is Vice President of New Nuclear Generation Strategy and Regulatory Engagement for Duke Energy. Uh, in this role, he has responsibility for strategy and regulatory interfaces for new nuclear generation to support the company's energy transition to net zero carbon emissions. Before joining uh, the Duke, he also worked at the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission and held many important positions at various offices, including the Office of Nuclear Reactor Regulation, Office of Nuclear Security and Incident Response, and the Office of Enforcement. Uh, Mr. Nolan has been working very closely with Purdue University for SMR feasibility study as a member of principals in charge. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Chris Nolan to the stage. So thank you, Dr. Kim, for your kind words and your hospitality every time I visit the university. Representative Pence, thank you for your participation today in highlighting the importance of the role of advanced nuclear technologies in meeting the challenges of climate change. Duke Energy values the collaboration with Purdue University in studying the potential for small modular reactors in Indiana. 
Rising fuel prices and our commitment to reduce greenhouse gas emissions have us at Duke Energy talking about, studying, and pursuing advanced nuclear technologies in a way we haven't in recent years. Over the decades, there have been varying levels of acceptance of nuclear technology. We see the dialogue on global warming changing the perceptions of the role of nuclear. Duke Energy has safely and reliably operated power plants for over 50 years. Our nuclear fleet has 11 units that generate 10.8 gigawatts of carbon-free electricity that represents 82% of the carbon-free generation for Duke Energy as a whole. Our units have redundant and diverse safety systems to protect the public, our employees, and the environment, setting industry benchmarks for safety, reliability, and efficiency. Our collaboration with Purdue brings one of the nation's top nuclear engineering programs uh, with Duke Energy experience as an operator of one of the largest nuclear fleets in the country to explore a carbon-free future. Any credible conversation regarding advanced nuclear technologies would be incomplete without recognizing the role of the Department of Energy in the playing that it plays in setting the vision for the nation, which brings us to our featured speaker. I would like to introduce Dr. Catherine Huff, who is currently serving as the Assistant Secretary for the Office of Nuclear Energy at the Department of Energy. Prior to her current role, she served as Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Nuclear Energy. Before joining the department, Dr. Huff was an Assistant Professor at the Department of Nuclear Plasma and Radiological Engineering at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, where she led Advanced Reactor and Fuel Cycle Research Group. She was also a Blue Water Assistant Professor with the National Center for Supercomputing Applications. She was previously a postdoctoral fellow in both the Nuclear Science and Security Consortium and the Berkeley Institute of Data Science at the University of California at Berkeley. She received her PhD in nuclear engineering from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 2013 and her undergraduate degree in physics from the University of Chicago. Her research focused on modeling and simulating, modeling and simulation of advanced nuclear reactors and fuel cycles. She's an active member of the American Nuclear Society as the past chair of both the Nuclear Nonproliferation and Policy Division and the Fuel Cycle and Waste Management Division, and recipients of both the Young Member Excellence and the Mary Jane Ostman Professional Women's Achievement Awards. Through leadership within Software Carpentry, SciPy, the Hackers Within, and the Journal of Open Source Software, she's an advocate for best practices in open, reproducible scientific computing. Please extend a warm hand of welcome to Dr. Huff. Oh, so sweet. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chris, for such a kind introduction. And thank you, Representative Pence, for your presence and your time today. I know it's incredibly valuable and for your service. I'm particularly grateful to my friend, uh, Professor Kim, as well as President Chang, who I was able to meet today, your brand new university president. Um, but mostly, I'm thankful for all of you here at Purdue for having me today. It's actually a great joy uh, to be back at a world-class Midwestern Engineering University. As you heard in my bio, I'm certainly partial to a number of world-class Midwestern engineering universities, and Purdue really is among one of my favorites. You know, it's been a few years since I came to visit, and you guys have great new buildings and an exciting forward movement. I'm really excited to see it. I promise today to speak about a vision for the future of nuclear energy, both domestically and abroad, as well as what the U.S. Department of Energy is doing to make that vision a reality. Uh, but with your cooperation, I would also like to touch on the role that you all may be able to play in helping us uh, in this endeavor from your position here at places like Purdue. What we're trying to accomplish really can't be achieved with at what you do without your work and your studies, your development of new nuclear technologies and innovation that can only happen at universities. And not just in a university, but world-class universities in the Midwest for engineering. It's very important that we have this core base of engineering capabilities that you all represent. Because we're, we're at a turning point, not just for nuclear energy, 
but for all of our efforts to tackle climate change uh, and for meeting the escalating challenges facing us in the context of energy security. As this audience knows, we cannot solve these problems without nuclear energy. President Biden is extremely serious about doing everything possible to get the U.S. powered by clean energy, using every single clean energy tool available. And nuclear energy is essential to this strategy. It's the only way we're going to reach our really ambitious goals of a 50% reduction in our carbon emissions by the end of this decade, 100% clean electricity by 2035, and a net zero economy by 2050. Uh, this is true not just in the U.S., but also worldwide. Um, the International Energy Agency estimates that in order to meet our climate commitments, nations around the globe will need to double our nuclear energy capacity by 2050. The United Nations Economic Commission for Europe goes further, with analyses indicating that the most successful strategies for decarbonization and carbon neutrality in 2050 would at least double or possibly triple the amount of nuclear energy capacity in the UN ECE region. Now, these are broad, multilateral organizations with members like nations like Germany as part of their membership. If you look to more nuclear-leaning organizations like the Nuclear Energy Institute or the International Atomic Energy Agency, those estimates go up, right, are even more optimistic and forward-leaning about what is going to be required in terms of bullish projections for nuclear growth. Now, I'm in DOE, and robust as all of those analyses are, we are fond of our own analyses, which do indicate that doubling nuclear power will be enough of a challenge, so that's what we're going for, right? Let's start there. If we are going to double nuclear capacity in the United States by 2050, it starts, growing of course, starts by not shrinking. And to meet these goals, we cannot afford to lose any of our existing clean energy infrastructure. That includes across the globe, keeping the existing nuclear plants, 400 of them at least, there's well over 400 uh, plants across the globe online, 92 of which are operating here in the United States. The long-term physical sustainability of the current fleet of light water reactors here in the U.S. relies on research and development capabilities at the national laboratories as well as universities. Light water reactor operational sustainability also, of course, also relies on a uniquely skilled and capable workforce. In addition to the thousands of skilled craftspeople and union uh, workers, that fleet of reactors also needs nuclear engineers, civil engineers, electrical engineers, outage managers, project managers, radiation safety experts, radiation health safety experts, operations and regulatory expertise, not to mention the operators that are be being trained right here at Pier 1. So that's many of you, and you're going to play a role as the older set of that workforce retires. Uh, there's a real need for you all to step in just to maintain the existing fleet because in order to grow, we cannot shrink, right? U.S. nuclear reactors are the single largest source of carbon-free electricity on the grid today. They support nearly half a million high-paying U.S. jobs. They also contribute millions of dollars in tax revenues that help support local economies and school systems and infrastructure. In many cases, they sustain communities. And losing a plant due to premature closure, purely due to economic reasons, it's unacceptable because it can have a really stark impact on those communities. So we absolutely must find ways to keep those plants up and running. And 2022 was a huge year for our ability to do so. Uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law was passed and it provides $6 billion with a B uh, for the civil nuclear credit program. And that is intended to keep the nation's nuclear reactors operating, particularly those at specific economic risk. Owners and operators under this program can apply for certification and bid for credits to support their continued operations, and they, therefore, can avoid premature retirement due to economic factors. These credits will help keep as many reactors online as possible, and as you may know, DOE has already certified Diablo Canyon for a conditional award. Alongside actions by the state of California, this opens the door for continued operation of that plan on an electric grid in the West that is particularly in need of clean firm power. So beyond this, the 2022 Inflation Reduction Act also includes production tax credits to help support existing reactors economically. So I'm really hopeful that these economic incentives 
are going to increase the number of license extensions that we see uh, submitted to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. You know, as you may know, many nuclear reactors have already submitted license extensions from their original 40-year lifetimes uh, of 20 years up to new 60-year lifetimes, and some are already applying for 80-year lifetimes. I think the R&D that we do across the nuclear national laboratories and universities like your own may even help them get to 100 years, and that's what's going to be required for more than a quarter of them to, uh, sorry, only a quarter of them with 80-year 80, 80 license extensions will make it to 2050. So, if we would like our existing fleet to make it to 2050, we should establish the scientific basis through which the Nuclear Regulatory Commission might rely on the information that you generate to uh, award license extensions perhaps as high as 100 years. Uh, they're not ready yet, they're just evaluating these 80-year license extensions, but the science we do today could contribute to some of these reactors being online in 2050. So. Uh, there's a lot that has to happen in order for that to occur. You know, advancing our knowledge of continued lifetimes for advanced aging light water reactor materials, new control system digitization, operations efficiency, accident tolerant fuels, energy economics, etc. All of that takes place in research reactors and thermal test loops, and it happens in glove boxes and in hot cells and on laptops, and it happens on supercomputers, and a lot of that happens here at universities. So that work is done by you. And we're going to need you to keep doing it if we're going to have that existing reactor fleet contributing to our 2050 goals. Now, of course, in order to double the amount of nuclear power in the country, we can't just keep the existing ones online. We must also build new advanced reactors. Uh, so advanced nuclear energy systems, of course, hold enormous potential to meet our energy and climate goals. They're more flexible and versatile. They leverage decades of learning uh, on coolants and fuels that are quite advanced, and they could be designed to meet the needs of the communities that use them because they come in a range of sizes from a few megawatts all the way up to more than gigawatts, right? Many can adjust their electricity output to match demand and pair with renewables to provide around-the-clock emissions-free electricity, and they can expand the benefits of nuclear power to new markets. That includes applications well beyond electricity generation. I think many of you are already thinking about that with your faculty and your research groups. And some technologies like these micro reactors and small modular reactors, advanced reactors of multiple sizes, are intended to be online within this coming decade. Some through Department of Energy support, uh, and some through private investment and enthusiasm, as well as Department of Defense support. So because of small modular reactors and micro reactors and their simpler, more compact designs, our hope is that utilities like Duke, you know, may have more options to deploy nuclear power and communities may have more particular uses for those different sizes. So we're hoping that we'll see communities interested in developing reactors in locations that would otherwise be unable to support larger power plants um, because micro and small modular reactors are available. They're also nicely right-sized to replace aging and retiring fossil plants. Now, communities and developers could take advantage of existing infrastructure at retiring coal plants, as well as the highly skilled workforce that exists in those places um, in order to deploy small modular reactors. As these coal plants retire, in DOE, my vision for 2050 is that we're really eager to pursue these kinds of projects that replace and repurpose fossil assets like retiring coal plants, or even retiring natural gas plants that can't be mitigated by carbon capture and sequestration. Um, some will be mitigated by carbon capture and sequestration, and I have great hope for that technology. But for those that can't, or for those that are retiring anyway, we hope to bring those communities along in the energy transition. And my intent is, of course, to focus on the retiring coal plants. Here in the United States, nearly one-third of the coal fleet retired during the 2010s, and a quarter of the remaining capacity has announced plants retire. In lost generation, in the 2010s, that means we lost 80 gigawatts electric of coal-fired generation. And today, there are planned retirements for 52 gigawatts, right? So that's like 80 or 52 gigawatt-scale nuclear reactors. And those, are, those 52 gigawatts are retiring in the next 15 years. Our carbon reduction goals even add to the pressure to continue retiring those coal plants. 
right? It should accelerate the pace of that retirement, and that is a policy choice. But repowering a coal station with nuclear is one way to replace that capacity while utilizing what would otherwise be stranded assets and providing some economic opportunity not only to the site owners but also to the workers and surrounding communities. And that is most important. There are many skilled workers at risk of losing their jobs when coal plants retire. Um, when those coal plants retire, those workers are perfectly suited to transition into a nuclear power plant. I don't think I need to tell this group of people that the construction and operation of nuclear power plants requires a lot of the same skills as the operation of existing coal plants. It requires an incredible number of skilled union crafts people like welders and electricians, the construction trades, and yes, even union boiler makers. So while they might not see their skills leveraged in the long-term operations of other clean energy technologies, these folks do have skills that are shovel ready for the transition to nuclear energy. And so when we think about a transition from today's carbon intensive electric grid to a carbon free, even net zero energy system by 2050, we are going to have to transition those communities along with uh, the energy. But these benefits are especially important for the disadvantaged communities that were disproportionately impacted by the fossil fuel, uh, excuse me, for the fossil fuel pollution that is already there. And, you know, we're seeing that this is the plan for our Advanced Reactor Demonstration Awardee TerraPower. Uh, they'll be building their natrium demonstration reactor in Wyoming, and that should help us decarbonize our electric sector. Um, but, but that is going to be at a retiring coal plant in Kemmerer. So they, they are already using the high voltage power lines, workers, the, you know, um, construction trades and craftspeople and their networks, and they're supporting the same community that that coal plant that's retiring used to. So it's an excellent example. But, you know, beyond that reactor developer, the utility Pacific Corp also is really interested in working with the state and local representatives, and they're all working together to make this project a success. And Pacific Corp and TerraPower won't stop there, right? They're si they've just signed a new MOU to explore five new sites for additional natrium reactors by 2035. And, you know, for the nuclear engineers in the room, this is a very cool reactor. It's a lot like an EBR2 style, sodium cooled, metal fueled, fast spectrum reactor. It has a super neato, clean molten salt storage tank that should allow it to flex with the load on the grid, uh, making it perfect for pairing with renewable electricity. Um, if there's significant penetration in that region of solar power, then at, during the day when the sun shines, they can lower the amount of power that is being output by that natrium reactor simply by reducing the amount of thermal power that they convert from that molten salt storage tank into electricity. So it's very clever. Um, and it really supports what we would like to see as a template for the deployment of advanced and small modular reactors in place of these retiring fossil assets. A Department of Energy study that we just recently released found that there are hundreds of coal plant sites across the country that could be converted to nuclear power plant sites. Um, it's a great report, and according to it, this transition could help increase our nuclear ca power capacity to more than 250 gigawatts if we fully utilize it. It found that over 80% of retired and retiring coal sites in the U.S. are suitable for new advanced reactor technologies, that a community could potentially have a 92% tax increase in, or, sorry, a 92% increase in tax revenue over the coal site, right, and an increase in 650 jobs over their former coal plant operations. So this is huge, and reusing that coal-fired station infrastructure for new advanced reactors could leverage things like the high-voltage power lines and cooling, like cooling water access that reduces the cost between 15 and 35 percent, depending on the applications and the amount of reuse. So this is huge. It's a core promise of President Biden's administration, too. Uh, we have promised to deliver place-based solutions and ensure an equitable energy transition that really centers energy justice and environmental justice and doesn't leave communities behind. And, you know, that is, that's great. And Terra Power and its natrium reactor is just one example. The Department of Energy is cost-sharing advanced reactor deployments also in the state of Washington, the X Energy XE100 reactor has a four-module plant that they're building. It's a high-temperature pebble bed 
gas reactor. So this is helium-cooled, trisoparticle fueled uh, and extremely high temperatures, so uniquely high-quality heat in the, you know, 600, 700, 800 degrees Celsius, uh, which is really unmatched by other clean energy sources and has particular uses, for example, in the chemical industry or the production of hydrogen, where high-temperature electrolysis can be significantly more uh, efficient than a low-temperature electrolysis production of hydrogen on an energy return on investment basis. So these very high temperature reactors have an opportunity to play a role not just in decarbonizing our electricity sector, but also decarbonizing the production of chemicals and advanced catalysts, the production of hydrogen for a future hydrogen e economy, and of course uh, to rejuvenate the jobs in those communities where they would otherwise be left behind. So we're seeing a real opportunity there. Uh, additionally, the Department of Energy is supporting the carbon-free power project. So you're counting. We have three demonstration-scale, commercial-scale nuclear reactor deployments supported by DOE. And the third is the new-scale Voyager 6-pack. So this is a small light water reactor design. Um, so no advanced coolants and fuels, very standard water-cooled, low-enriched uranium-fueled, small modular reactor invented at a university. Uh, you may know that uh, Oregon State University, of course, had faculty member who was awarded in what was, what is now the N Nuclear Energy University program. W he was awarded a large research grant and Jose Reyes, professor, later became the founder of New Scale Power, which is now a publicly traded company and is deploying a reactor this decade uh, in Idaho. Uh, well, actually, is deploying six reactors, six modules in a six-pack, uh, and that's what's possible, right? A uh, university professor with their students can have a fantastic idea, and through long-term support from the Department of Energy, can create a device that will be built and contribute to our energy security, our energy reliability, and sustainability. And I think this is a fantastic story for you to keep in mind, because anything is possible, and it's only been a few decades since he first had this idea, but it's now, you know, on the ground, they're, they're ordering the long lead time components from, like, heavy manufacturing uh, forger capabilities, right? There are some components that it takes years to, con you know, spec and construct and make, right? Like the pressure vessels for these small modules. Um, they're 77 megawatts a piece, so they're pretty small, but medium forging is limited in the United States, and so they've had to partner with very specific custom foragers to construct these devices, and they've already ordered them. So a reality is happening. Anyway, all three of these reactors should be built by the end of the decade, turned on and online. So I'm really excited about them. This is, so we've covered how we need to keep existing reactors open. We've covered how we need to build new reactors. There's a lot of advanced reactor types out there. I haven't named all of them. There's dozens that the Department of Energy is supporting through our Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program, our N National Reactor Innovation Center, the Gateway for Advanced Innovation in Nuclear, and other cost-shared programs. But in order to do all this, we must also sustain and secure the fuel cycle. That includes the front end of the fuel cycle, mentioned by uh, Representative Pence. We have some real fuel cycle supply chain constraints, especially on the enrichment side, both for existing light low assay, low enriched uranium, and for advanced reactors, the high assay, low enriched uranium that they will need. Uh, that's something the Department of Energy is working hard at uh, with the help of Congress. Um, but ultimately, we also have to secure and sustain the back end of the fuel cycle. So again, as mentioned by Congressman Pence, we are reevaluating the way that we look at the future of managing our uh, stored spent fuel at all the reactor sites across the country through a consent-based process to identify a site for a consolidated interim storage facility. That's, uh, there's an open funding opportunity announcement for communities uh, that would like to form consortia to explore this possibility, um, but we're really excited right now to have just released and restarted that uh, process and in, under a sort of energy justice-centered consent-based uh, approach. So I'll leave you with sort of one thought. Um, you know, there's lots of priorities in this office. I've just rattled off all kinds of projects, I think really centered in the future, the future of nuclear energy in 2050. What it really looks like for me is the replacement of all our unabated fossil assets with advanced nuclear 
the lifetime extension of our existing plants to the fullest extent that science can support their safe operation and sustaining and securing both ends of the fuel cycle. With all of that, of course, there is going to need, there's going to be a great need for workforce. And so my ask to all of you, students, even faculty in the room, is this. You have incredible skills. You have computational skills and experimental skills. You're great at math. You have suffered through partial differential equations. And you, you have approached some very challenging, I mean, the diffusion equation alone isn't even the most complicated form of our sort of transport equation at the heart of neutronics, right? The transport equation is one of the hardest, I mean, it takes me two semesters to teach graduate students everything they need to know about the transport equation. And you all have the skills to manage that. There are many other fields that want skilled, brilliant people who are good at math and partial differential equations and can handle a really ugly PDE. But I beg of you. We are facing unfolding calamities across the world, including energy security. You know, energy has been used as a weapon of war this year. And climate change. I think you're all quite aware of it. And so you must not leave this field. So I beg of you, keep your skills in nuclear energy, and the world will thank you. That's all. Thank you so much. Uh, I don't know if you can hear me. All right, thank you uh, for the excellent talk. Um, looks like uh, you're missing your old job. Uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> but, uh, I missed the beginning with the talking points, but I got into lecture mode. Well, we do need you in the office, so stay put, please. Uh, all right, so um, before uh, when we uh, open this lecture to the, uh, to the public, we ask them to register and then ask them to uh, input some uh, questions if they have any. Uh, so I have a few questions from audience um, and related to your lecture. So um, I think, uh, you know, you mentioned about net zero by 2050 and uh, uh, discussed some things important for that to be achieved. Um, and in your opinion, what are the things that you think it's necessary or essential uh, for nuclear technology, especially advanced nuclear technology, to be deployed um, and to be able for us to be able to achieve uh, net zero by 2050? There are a lot of, you know, things to be uh, realized, but uh, if you can name a few that you think we should, you know, manage to. Thank you. Yeah, I think you know it's going to take a lot of effort. Um, to establish a supply chain that is secure and sustainable and onshored, right? There's a lot of medium heavy forgings that we just talked about where there's like just a few suppliers of the kinds of like large metal components that we need for advanced nuclear. There's also a great deal of, um, you know, workforce issues, frankly. It's not just skilled craftspeople, but nuclear engineers and civil engineers. But if you take the example of Vogel, you know, it occupied, you know, well over 10,000 skilled union laborers and uh, they had to have traveler union laborers from 48 states come to visit Georgia in order to build those two plants. And if we're going to build more than two plants, even if they're not gigawatt scale, it's going to take many tens of thousands of skilled laborers and engineers and radiation health physicists. And that is the thing that I worry about the most, is the development of the workforce. And I'm not just saying that because I'm at a university. Mm. Thank you. I, I, I do agree with you. And uh, I, let me be a little more specific on in the fuel. Uh, you, you did mention about the uh, fuel. And some of the advanced reactor technology requires, uh, you know, this, uh, this advanced nuclear fuel concept. Uh, TRISO is one of them. and. Uh, uh, which calls for a rapid development of infrastructure. And uh, I, I know that DOE is working hard to help develop this infrastructure. What is your DOE's position in uh, kind of milestones to achieve uh, mm -hmm. in this as aspect? Yeah, I think this is, a, this is a great question. So there's a fascinating supply chain report for every type of energy technology that DOE recently um, produced. There's like 14 of these reports. There's one for nuclear. And in it, we talk about TRISO fuels. We talk right. about the, you know, the type of fuel. This is, so trispectral isotropic fuels, not isotopic, isotropic, because it's about the sphericalness. Um, 
For our structuralized tropic fuels, of course, are incredibly robust to very high temperatures um, and pressures. And they have been developed over the course of many decades through not just the DOE investment, but research at universities, research abroad. And they are now at the point of commercialization. And there are, is a small pilot scale plant uh, that has been deployed at, in Tennessee, as well as just down the road from it, a commercial scale plant that should be for the TRISO X facility. So we're in a place where um, these companies really believe that it's at the verge of commercialization. And so what, what we need to see from them is at scale production of these particles at a high enough quality that they can be used commercially. We have used you know, particles like this in experimental reactors and we've had you know, high temperature gas reactors in the past like Peach Bottom and Fort St. Brain. But this will be an advancement that is, you know, needs to create a whole robust supply chain for a large number of reactors. So they need to scale up these, these endeavors and they're relying on many decades of DOE support but now they're sort of flying on their own. And so we really need to see that private investment sustain them through the like hard valley of commercialization. Okay, great. Um, and uh, uh, another question that uh, I received was uh, you know, from audience was what makes SMR uniquely attractive for DOE to support um, in comparison to other traditional LWRs? So, yeah. yeah. So. Um, Someone said this to me, and for the life of me, I cannot remember who it was originally, but now we say it all the time in DOE, is that we would like to be building reactors more like airplanes than airports, right? The way that we have historically built gigawatt scale reactors is stick built construction on site at, at, in a very boutique way, right? And you don't really want a bespoke reactor. Mm -hmm. You want them to be coming off the factory line just like a 747. Right? It should be highly regulated uh, and well controlled, but um, that kind of economy of scale happens at the factoryization of the construction of nuclear power plants, which is only possible really at the scale of small modular reactors and smaller. That's the modularity, by the way, in the small modular mm -hmm. reactor sense. It's really about the construction. Okay. Um. Let's uh, uh, talk about the existing fleet. <laughs> you did mention, uh, I, I was glad to hear that uh, in your talk about uh, existing fleets. Uh, as you said, uh, you know, we cannot achieve, uh, you know, net zero by 2050 without really uh, having this existing fleet to be operated. Um, so, uh, but the reality, as you know, uh, is that uh, there have been a lot of uh, reactor sites permanently shut down. Um, and, you know, there has been a lot of stagnation and delay in the deploying nuclear power plants, even though we finally deployed, which is great. Uh, what, is, uh, uh, what is your perspective or DOE's position in addressing this issue or helping uh, existing fleet to, to go on? And uh, you did mention about, uh, you know, life uh, extension. Right. And, and I think it's worth sort of diving into deeper sort of the role that you all can play. It's materials testing, right? right? Like how long can the pressure vessel withstand continued hard radiation that like those fast neutrons at the edge? We've done some clever things with, you know, fuel arrangement to avoid the fastest neutrons being at the edge of that reactor core, protecting in that way the pressure vessel itself from radiation damage over the long term. But figuring out precisely how long we can trust that pressure vessel to continue to maintain its, um, you know, um, capability uh, is, first of all, it's the job of the NRC to determine whether it's safe. All the DOE can do is support the research and development that helps NRC answer the questions that they have or helps research um, progress to a place where vendors can use the information to convince the NRC uh, based on science at the labs and the universities, what's possible. And it's not just materials, it's digitization. Like the mm -hmm. Pure One reactor, right, is a great example of a fully, I mean, it's the example of a fully digital control system. And it's important for existing light water reactors to move into that space because there are, um, there is a deprecation of components where, you know, not all of the analog little lights and diodes and widgets that allow a reactor control panel to work at our, you know, 92 operating reactors, not all of them can be purchased commercially anymore. And so we're ransacking the control systems of many of the shutdown reactors in order to enable the components to be replaced. And that can't continue forever. Digitization is the way forward. And I think we're in a great spot with DOE support to see some commercial reactors follow the Purdue example. Okay, great. <laughs> 
Um, let's, uh, you know, shed a little bit of different light uh, for the nuclear power. Recently, uh, you know, fusion made a uh, big news yeah. uh, by producing more energy than uh, supplied. Uh, if you can share DOE's perspective on fusion reactor for the future. It is so interesting. So yeah. fusion energy isn't in my office, but I get to engage with our fusion energy sciences division in the Office of Science, as well as, you know, the interested folks in RPE who have a fusion program, and occasionally I get to interact, you know, with, with folks outside of that, you know, in the White House, for example, in the Office of Science and Technology Policy, who are interested in seeing fusion commercialized. And what we've seen in the last year is incredible increase in the amount of private investment in fusion, and we've seen this impressive shot, um, which of course was at NIF and you know focused on our you know nuclear nonproliferation security administration mission under NNSA rather than really you know towards the commercialization of fusion. But it's a demonstration of what's possible for mm -hmm. fusion and a real from DOE's perspective, a real moment to celebrate you know American success in science, the long-term investment. That taxpayers from the university sector, so, <laughs> so, um, White cell. from the university sector, so, <laughs> so, um, White cell. yeah. So uh, I, I, this final question is somewhat related, and uh, it's a loaded question um, in a way. Uh, yeah. But uh, uh, what does the future look like for nuclear energy, in the DOE's perspectives, and uh, and also? Uh, I think uh, it's important, we always talk about public perception, right? And uh, I think uh, we cannot have a future unless public accept nuclear energy as a future energy source. And uh, I, I realize that, you know, uh, I communicate or interact with the young generation, you know, because I'm at the university, and I can see that uh, young generation is uh, keen on climate change and uh, they are much more receptive of nuclear energy. Um, but general public you know, perception and the, uh, the opinion is still very much mixed. And maybe it's kind of a, you know, stagnated uh, compared to uh, uh, 20, 2000 or even before. So, so let me ask you, uh, how can we improve? And what is the, what, I know that DOE is doing a lot uh, in uh, advocating nuclear, but how can we improve on this public perception uh, in order to kind of have a future for nuclear energy uh, as an energy mix and to achieve uh, net zero by 2050? So I know this is a- <laughs> There's so <laughs> many ways. Question. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I do think, I, I do think we are in a good place, a better place than we've ever been. And I think right. you noted this well, right? It's very bipartisan. It is focused on the science. Folks who are doing the math on climate change have come around to recognize that if we're going to meet our climate goals in a timely manner, we must deploy nuclear. Uh, you know, I've s rattled off some studies um, from these international organizations at the top of the hour, and, and that's, that's precisely what needs to get out there, is that scientific groups are all agreeing that nuclear is needed. But not only should we like make sure that the public is aware that nuclear is needed, but also share with them the things that matter to them. You know, what's their role in this clean energy technology? You heard me just yammer on about jobs, and it's not just because I'm in the government now. It is because that is what matters to people in the United States as they look toward a transition. They want to know where do they fit, right? And and what does it mean for their economics? What does it mean for their community? It, they really do care about that. And if there's a role for them in this very strange thing called nuclear power, I think Americans are ready for it. Um, and generally speaking, I do think the youth are about to have their moment. And you all know how to Google things and find out facts. And you have great detectors of nonsense in your heads because you've had to filter the internet for your whole youths. And your nonsense detectors are on in a way that a lot of generations ahead of you haven't been. And I think you will filter, you and your colleagues in, not in nuclear engineering will be p perfectly capable of filtering the nonsense that has plagued nuclear energy perception. Well, thank you very much. And uh, uh, as we close uh, today's event, uh, you know, I'd like to take this opportunity to ask you to please save the date uh, for our next lecture, um, which will be held on Wednesday, February 22nd at 3.30 p.m. here in Fowler Hall. Uh, in this lecture, it will be a little different. We'll invite leaders from various sectors of nuclear energy, including nuclear vendor, utility, and regulation, and have a panel discussion uh, on potential opportunities and challenges 
in actually bringing advanced nuclear power reactors to reality. Uh, this should be a very interesting discussion, so uh, please mark your calendar and make sure to join us. Uh, with that, I want to thank everyone uh, to, for joining us today, and once again, our sincere thanks to Dr. Katie Huff uh, for this excellent lecture and discussion, and I also personally wanted to thank you for your leadership at the Office of Nuclear Energy at the U.S. Department of Energy. Thank, uh, thank you very much, and uh, I hope to see you again uh, in February. Thank you. Great job. <laughs> oh. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. I was a little stiff at the beginning. <laughs> Let me give this mic back.